Man. It's really a lot of fun for me to introduce to you the Reverend Corky Carlisle. Corky is an Episcopal priest currently serving as the interim rector in, at Holy Trinity Episcopal Church in Auburn, Alabama. Corky, when I left St. John's in Decatur in Diocese, Alabama, to come here, Corky became the interim rector at St. John's while I was there. It's important in introducing Corky to say what he is not um, first before saying what he is. Unlike recent guests in the Rector's Forum, Corky is not a bishop. He does not hold a, 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 an endowed chair at any prominent university or seminary. He barely remembers seminary for that matter. He is not a published author. He brings no books. Um, whatsoever. Lie. He is Lie. here, though, for a number of different reasons. He, first and foremost, is a storyteller. So he peddles stories, not books. And in all seriousness, he is one of my favorites, and I know you enjoy him. He also has a lot of connections with people and with me um, here in Memphis. He, for example, was the camp counselor for a few of our parishioners at Camp Bratton Green back in the day in the Diocese of Mississippi. He was our senior warden there. Antoinette Cheney, he was her camp counselor, and when I told Antoinette that Corky was coming, she said, that was a long time ago. Uh, all I can remember about him was him talking. I don't really remember much of what he said, but I just remember him talking. So he talks a lot, but eventually there's a great story there. He, he's also here because, and, and this is the most important thing, he is a dear friend of mine, and he is someone who has taught me a lot about life. He's great company. He's someone I have just been waiting for a number of years to introduce him to you and you to him. And that brings me just great joy because I love introducing friends. And y'all are, even though you've not met him, y'all have kindred spirits um, because it's from this place and from all of you and from him that I'm so often reminded of the importance of joy, the importance of beauty, the importance of humility, and above all, how stories hold just such great power in our lives and hold the key to unlock often what we're trying to unlearn. So I'm so glad to introduce him to you and you to him. And I know you will join me in welcoming Corky warmly to the Rector's Forum at Grace St. Luke, who speaks about money and meaning. <laughs> Welcome, Corky. There will be a bookmobile <laughs> of my books that arrives soon after the service. They are all published by a, not the same, they're published by the same publisher that published the first green book, if you are that long in the Episcopal Church. How many are you long enough in the Episcopal Church to remember the green book? About four or five of you. How many of you remember the Liturgy of the Lord's Supper? How many of you remember that I preached here once before? <laughs> I took a great deal of money away from here. Fr from you. And I intend to do that today. So would you please do me a favor and reach in your pockets and get all your money out? <laughs> Really. <laughs> you can put it on the table if you're afraid to take it out of your wallet to show you, show how much it is. Just get it out there. Put it out there on the table. No. You're already recalcitrant and you're sitting on the front row. Just, 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 just put it out there and, and leave it. I'm taking my wallet back. My friend Greg Rickle says, and Greg is the Bishop of Olympia. Do you mind if I get rid of that thing? He's the Bishop of Olympia, and he said, what the church has got to do is stop lying about money. We have got to stop lying about it. We've got to hush our mouths and quit lying about money. So that's what I am here today 
to do. And I'm going to start with a little thing that I, kind of an overview of what I believe about money and values, and then I'll get into the, maybe the meat of it. We read, this is my experience, is most people read the Gospels like we have no money. That Jesus must be talking to some other people. Because you know what he talked about more than he talked about anything else was what we do with our money. But we read it like we have no money. And we spend our money, my experience, myself, and most people I know in the church, like we've never read the Gospels. Like that what is in there has nothing to do with how we live our lives. I'm con convinced that the first step in a serious response to the call to follow Jesus is the decision that we must make about our use of money. Going away, our wealth is, at the same time, the easiest and most demanding way to start being a disciple of Jesus. We live fearfully, I find most of us, in a land floating, flowing with milk and honey. And we act like we're going to go broke tomorrow. The assumption of scarcity hangs over us like a pall. There's not enough to go around, we fear, and so we think we must fill our barns up lest we starve to death someday. In fact, you know, during the economic downturn, do you know what two businesses flourished during that time? The storage business, where you could put the things that would not fit in your house anymore, so that you could save them for your grandchildren who will have forgotten about them. And the other is the security business. So that you can lock your things away so that somebody else can't get in to get them from you. We fear that we must fill those barns lest we starve to death someday. The reality, of course, is that we live not in the midst of scarcity but of incredible abundance, most of us. In fact, you can go on this global, there's a, a, a website, globalrichlist.com, and you can type in how much money you made last year, and it'll tell you what number you are in the world. And if you made over $36,000 last year, you're in the top 1%. The reality is that we live not in the midst of scarcity, but of abundance. The problem is, is not that there are, isn't enough resources to go around. The problem is how they are distributed. And we are part of the distribution business. It's hard to see this because our wealth is on paper, except for the numbers that we could get no paycheck looks larger or weighs more than another. I see the, the secretary, the bookkeeper at Holy Trinity making out the checks and she puts them in those open boxes. Well, now she finally, they're automatically deposited, but she puts a copy of the thing in the, everybody's open box. They all look the same, and yet there's some that are $100 and there's some that are 5000 but we, we, we don't do it. What, what if we did, but what if we did this? If we stacked up all the money we had and all the stuff we had against everybody else, we would see the profound disparity of it. I preached on the day after 9-11 and I said the horror that we had 3,000 people killed yesterday was a horrible tragedy to behold this country. However, the worst tragedy of that is that there will be 3,000 children, mostly, that will die before we go to bed tonight because they didn't have an infant IV needle, because they didn't have enough food to eat, or because there wasn't a mosquito net to keep them from getting bitten by a mosquito. And that happens every day. 
We don't want to see that. There was a movie I saw way back when I was at the University of Mississippi in Oxford called No Blade of Grass. And it was about how global warming or something, I don't think they called it that then, was creeping all over the world and people were starving to death. And the movie was taken while there was this great buffet before people. And it was like today, you know, there's a TV over in the corner and the TV is showing all the people starving to death as the other people are filling up their plates, pushing other people out of the side to get in the way so that they can get more food on their plate. I think we would be appalled by the disparity if we saw it really. And I believe that the basic problem in our society is greed. My father used to tell me there are only two kinds of people, the grateful and the greedy. And he said, we're somewhere along that, that spectrum, most of us. And he said, ask people what they would like to put, have put on their tombstone. Here lies Antoinette Cheney, the greediest woman in Memphis. <laughs> or here lies Antoinette Cheney. Her generosity changed many people's lives. Of course we want that. But fear keeps us from that many times. Greed infects young and old, it infects rich and poor, it infects uh, the perversion of our need for material goods, it's distorted our healthy needs and turned our needs into insatiable wants that we can't live like. It's like the Texas rancher who said, I don't want all the land, I just want the land next door. Or Henry Ford, when asked how much money he needed, how much was it when he got enough? And he said, just a little more than I got. That would be enough. By the way, Pamela York Kleiner, who's a wonderful uh, coach, says that enough is simply having what you need last as long as you need it. She said, the problem is in the West, we do not have any notion of what we need because what we needed two years ago, what we wanted two years ago and got 18 months ago, we now believe we need. I have never wanted a dentist. Never. <laughs> I have never wanted a dentist, but I know I need a dentist. It's important to differentiate that in your life of between what you want and what you need. Uh, G. T. Chesterton says there are two ways to get enough. One is to continue to accumulate more and more. The other is to desire less and less. I have a friend who said she has never ever given something away that she's regretted that she gave it away, but she has bought a whole hell of a lot of things that she wished she hadn't have bought. So if you can get to the point where you can buy into Henry Nowen's, our road to God is downward mobility, not upward. You know, we have a church. I'm going to begin to nose around. We have a church that rewards people who make more money. There are wonderful people in our church who are priests who ought to be serving in Itabina, Mississippi. And Alto, Tennessee. But they can't serve there because they don't have enough money or they're not paid enough money so that they, when, when they retire, the pension fund that they get will be significantly lower so they can't live on it. So I suggested to the pension fund that there was a way they could solve that. How? And what happens is those good priests that go there then end up, like poor Richard, you know, in a big church like this. <laughs> you know, he ought to be in Itabina. Um, no, 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 I didn't say that. End up in a place they don't belong so they can have the money. And the pension fund, if you go to a credo, they say, follow your passion. 
follow your passion. I told them, I followed my passion. I went to Kenya, and I was paid $4,800 a year in Kenya. The good people of St. John's to Church Decatur paid my salary for my time, my eight years in Kenya. $4,800 a year. So if I'd continued that, I could have retired from the pension fund making about $6,000 a year and try to live on that unless I was still in Kenya. So I suggested we just make it all even. They said, what do you mean? I said, we're all priests, we're all in this together, we're all pulling the same stick along the way. I, guarantee, I can guarantee you, in many, in many ways, Barbara Brown Taylor, you know who she is? Fabulous speaker, Episcopal Church, best preacher we got around. Barbara Brown Taylor moved the, from the assistants at All Saints Atlanta to Grace Church Calvary in uh, Clarksville, Georgia. And she moved because she said she had so much work to do there, she needed more time to do her preaching, preparation, and teaching. And, she, and I said, Barbara, you're making a big mistake. She said, why? I said, you'll have a lot more work at Grace Church Calvary as the rector than you would at an assistant. She found that out and quit in two years. She wrote a book about it called Leaving Church. But make it all even. So that when Richard Lawson retires after 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, and he's been in a big place and enjoyed a lot of money and had a good time, and somebody else has been in a small place and enjoyed themselves but hadn't made much money, all our pensions will be the same. You'd have thought that I was asking for the overthrow of everything. One woman even said, it's communist. That's just communist. I said, no, it's Christian. Because we promise in our baptismal vows that we're going to do what care alike for young and old, rich and poor, strong and weak. We make these promises, but then we somehow don't do them. Where was I? Less and less. Money, money is the spiritual issue. Money is the issue. Money is the primary issue that is in the middle of everything we do. Money is the, the thing that is not on the table. Uh, you know, you, what, what, what is it you can't talk about? Religion, sex, politics, and money. Well, I go to many tables that the other three are talked about, kind of ad nausea. Bring up money. Don't want to do that. The gospel calls us to have another one of these things. The gospel calls us to, to recover our balance between those things. John Wesley said, when I have any money, I get rid of it as quickly as possible, lest it should find a way into my heart and become my heart. Luther said, if, you're, if our goods are not available to the community, they are stolen goods. Let me say that again. If our goods are not available to the community, they are stolen goods. So the question for the people, you, where, where, where is your community? Grace St. Luke's Episcopal Church, Memphis, Tennessee. These are the people, I mean, it may be scary for you, that you're betting on spending eternity with. You know, you may wish it was another group, but, the, but this, the, this is it. So it is that if you're not willing to give and put your money that you think is yours, your resources at the behest of this community for the community's good, then what you have, Luther is saying, is stolen. Hard words. We don't think that way, do we? The gospel calls us to recover that kind of thinking. They're radical words indeed, but they are no more radical than Jesus' own life teaching and witness when he says, go, sell all you have, and come and follow me, and you will have treasure in heaven. First letter of John, how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? 
Little children, let us love in word and deed, not in word or speech, but in truth and in action. It's a matter about conversion. It, this business about our money is to be converted from the money to God. Paul speaks of the grace of generosity. The word grace really means a gift. He talks about the gift of generosity. It is God's gift to us that we become generous people. Generosity is a gift of God for the people of God. Not unlike that gift of God of that bread and wine that we receive. When we are converted, our pocketbooks get converted too. And you know what happens on Sunday morning, every Sunday morning in church? I'm a, I wasn't going to do this, but I will. What happens up there with the priests? What do they do with that bread? They take it, then what do they do with it next? They bless it first. And then they break it, and then they do what? Give it away. That is the pattern that God has for our life, taking, blessing, breaking, and giving. So what happens when that alms basin, you know, as a retired priest, I'm horrified to sit in congregations where people pass the alms basin by and they'll put a blooming thing in it. They don't understand that that's how they get up there. How many of you baked the bread that we're going to use this morning? How many of you squeezed your feet over that grapes and made that wine. Well, see, that's the way they used to do it. And so they knew. That's why they talked about, we are on the table. Well, we get on the table by putting something in there. Oh, you say, I send it in by online everywhere. Well, put a dollar in there. Put 50 cents. Put, some, put something in there. If I did this and we were in church, I'd have some child get in the alms basin. Or in North Carolina, I did it, and there were, were no children in the church because they Took them all out because they were afraid of what I was going to say. I'd say dirty words or something. And the only thing that was in there was a small baby. And this mother came up and put this three-week-old baby in that alms basin. And there was a gasp. And a man in the back said, my God, we get it. We get it. We get it. It's us that goes in that offering. It's we that are the offering that we're making. And it changes us when we understand that way. And then we, you know, then God takes us and then he blesses us. And then the hard part about it, God has to break us. Why? Because we fall in love with a whole bunch of bad things that keep us from loving and experiencing all that God has for us. And sometimes we fall in love with a bunch of good things. And so we put people and places and families and institutions and a whole bunch of things in the place of God. And so we have to be broken from that so we can be given away. In the hymn, if I can get this thing to work. In the hymn, Awake, Awake to Love and Work, it says in that hymn, the, the prayer is that Jesus will come and set our souls ablaze. Now, it's an Episcopal hymn. You understand that? It's, it's, it's not for the Pentecostals. It's not for the foot-washing Baptists. It's for the Episcopalians that God would come and set our soul ablaze. I think it's hymn number nine. You can look at it when you get in there this morning. And it, what do we get our souls set ablaze for? The next line says, To give and give and give again what God hath given thee to spend thyself nor count the cost to serve right gloriously. That's what we're about. In Martin Luther's great hymn, A Mighty Fortress, he says, let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill, but God's truth about us still. We sing these things. Do we live them out and believe them? Where was I on what I did this thing? Well, we, not, we need to give not only for the sake of our brothers and sisters in need, but for God's sake because of that baptismal covenant business. That we, serve, we seek and serve Christ in all persons. 
And in my life, I found most especially in those who are different from me, who don't look like me, whose skin may be a different color from me. Republicans. <laughs> God has sent me and sent me as my best friends in this world to Republicans. Because my granddaddy taught me on my knee when I was four years old. He said, honey, he said you can say a good thing about every Democrat, but it's damned hard to find a good thing to say about any Republican. <laughs> so I took it as my call to do this. You, you probably think that about Democrats. But it is that we find who we are supposed to share our love with in doing that because God breaks that down to have it happen. We give for God's sake because grace is not cheap but costly. Because God gave his dear son up on the cross for us and calls us to follow that great example with great humility. We are called to link our money to the gospel by living, and here it goes. I said this in Houston, Texas in 1974, and a woman on the front, sitting about right there on the front pew, stood up and said, you are red. She meant I was a communist. Living simpler lives. Simpler lives. It is the hardest thing in the world for me to live a simple life. I want to go everywhere. I want to do everything. I want to be a part of everything. I want to see everything. You know, I'm ADD, so I want to buy this today, and I want to get this tomorrow, and I want to take that watch today. You know, all of the things that are. But we are called to live a simpler life in our homes, in our cars, in the clubs we belong to, in the money we spend for vacations, in the food we eat, we are known by our checkbooks. They tell the story of our values. I'm going to share this complete story that I wrote down many years ago. There was a missionary friend of mine, a Lutheran in Africa. Um, there's pens falling out of my pocket that I didn't even have in there. Um, and he had been talking to this young man about being a Christian. The young man was an animist, and they'd been talking for a long time. In, the, in their conversation one day, the young man brought into their conversation, he was supposed to bring in objects, and they were supposed to talk about them. He brought in an idol, and he put the idol down on the table. And then he brought in a coin, a Kenyan coin, worth a shilling, and put this down on the table. And then he wrote a note and put by each of those things, and he said to my friend, please read these. And my friend said he looked down, and next to the idol he had written, heathen God. And next to the coin, he had written, Christian God. Because he had seen all the merchants and everybody who, basically the British and other people who had come to Kenya, all they were interested in was the money. So he thought that surely the Christians, God, the symbol of it, must be the money. How many of you still have checkbooks? Some of you do. My, my son tells me that nobody under 30 is going to ever have a, write another check as long as they live. But go home and check and see what your priorities are in your life by what you've spent your money on the last month. See where that money has gone. See what gets the biggest chunk. I can tell you, my wife can tell you, probably more than me, that something changed in our household when the biggest amount was written to the church 
and it became larger than the next writ largest amount, which happened to be written to the mortgage company for the house. So she said, we changed from putting God kind of at the top of this pyramid instead of our house. But just see where you are in your priorities of those things. All right. We are called to link our money to the gospel by living those simpler lives, and we're supposed to look at that checkbook and everything, and they will tell us what our values are. The church, though, is also called to live more simply. And I may get somebody to hit me. They are to forego expensive buildings and furnishings, creature comforts that make the church look more like a country club than a house of prayer. I admire shabby churches. When I go to a church and find it sort of shabby, it seems like that they're kind of full of people that are maybe dirty and don't have enough. And maybe that's what it's supposed to be. Maybe it's not supposed to be so fixed up. The grace of generosity calls us to give away in mission and ministry to others at least as much as we spend on ourselves. The Shaker hymn says it this way, "'Tis the gift to be simple, "'tis the gift to be free, "'tis the gift to come down where we ought to be, "'and when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. We read the gospel as if we had no money, and we spend our money as if we know nothing of the gospel. It's time to get the two back together. Now, I've done what Greg Rickle said I needed to do, 